since 2014, I've been trying to track down information on the Lingostown Orphanage and Home, Masonic Home. Uh, the most worshipable Prince Hall Grand Lodge of PA uh, owns the home and actually started on the home before, uh, all the way back in 1908. For those of us who don't really know much about the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, you have to know Prince Hall. This is an amazing man. He came up from the West Indies prior to the Revolutionary War and landed in Boston. He actually joined the Revolutionary soldiers at Bunker Hill. He fought in the Revolutionary War. He was one of the first African Americans to own property and he actually voted in Massachusetts. He went before the Massachusetts Assembly and using the same principles that were used in the Constitution, he fought to get rid of slavery in Massachusetts. He was one of our very first abolitionists. This guy then, right at the end of the Revolutionary War, he met, he wanted to have a Mason, a Masonic Temple. He wanted to, to form the group. Well, the thinkers in Massachusetts didn't think they wanted to do that. So what did he do? He went to the Brits, and they gave him his first charter. And he started in Massachusetts. In the 1790s, he came to Philadelphia, and he helped start the Masons in Philadelphia. Now, I'm not a Mason, but for those of you that are Masons, or those that know of the Masons, understand that they're formed to help people, education-wise, taking care of the elderly, taking care of the orphans, taking, helping to promote people okay, within their group, within their area, within their community, and helping to, them to grow. Prince Saul believed in that, and he did that all his life. This is 1990 in downtown Philadelphia. This is the Grand Lodge for all of Pennsylvania. They were celebrating almost 100 years in 19, I'm sorry, almost 200 years in 1990. So you have to understand, this was going on for over 200 years, long before the Civil War. Okay, these men were building a community, they were taking care and helping the people in that community. And one of the things they did in uh, Philadelphia is education. They helped to get schools going, they helped to educate the people that couldn't get the proper education. This is when they got their plaque from the state to recognize them, and this was in 1990. At this point in time, I want to make sure I'm right, so I'm going to look at my notes. There was 6,000 uh, lodges across the country and 325,000 African American Masons. And this was thanks to our friend Prince Hall. Fantastic guy. But then our Mason Lodge in Philadelphia, and I have to call it ours because for so many years I've been reading about it. They got a charter here in Pennsylvania, in Lingostown, and they bought the Castle Farm. They bought this farm in 1908. And the reason I have the articles is there are no pictures. But it was all over the state these Masons came from. They were from Altoona, they were from Erie, they were from Philadelphia, they were from Pittsburgh, and they were from Harrisburg. Now down on the bottom, I just want to point this out now, and we'll talk a little bit about them later, but you'll see the name John Quincy Adams. You'll see this throughout the presentation because his name was on the deed for the farm. This talks about the dedication for the farm. This was the announcement, May 14, 1909, about dedicating the farm. And at this point, it was still mentioned it was for the aged, it was a home. They didn't really start using the word orphans uh, until after it was actually dedicated. But there were going to be both orphans and elderly from all over the state that went to uh, 
the, to, the, to the home. Now this was what they had, it would be just before they dedicated, this was what was in the home. The new home is located within the boundaries of Lingostown. Well, really isn't. It's outside of Lingostown. But Bill and I will always fight that. Uh, <laughs> you have to remember, in 1909, and Bill can correct me on this, but in 1909, Lingostown was the main area of Lower Paxton Township. There weren't any other developments. Everything else was farms. In 1909, all the shopping was done in Lingostown. Anything, education, the doctors were all here, there were three general stores, everything was in Lingolstown. If you wanted to buy feed, you went to the feed store in Lingolstown, which is now a pizza shop. <laughs> there were 65 acres on the farm. This is what helped pay the bills at the farm. The wheat, the corn, the potatoes, the oats. But what I was amazed at, there was an orchard of between 200 and 300 trees. Depending which article you read, some say 200 trees, some say 300 trees. But they had apples and they had peaches. By the way, that article was out of the Altoona paper. So when they wrote about the orphanage, it wasn't just the Harrisburg paper. It was Altoona, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. Everybody wanted to know what they were doing. <coughs> this was sent to me by the historian of the Grand Lodge. And it is the actual broadside that was sent around to all of the other lodges and all of the areas announcing that there would be a new Masonic home uh, in Lingostown. The amazing thing here that I thought was great, especially for those that heard our trolley presentation, they put right on the bill that it was a 40-minute trolley ride from Harrisburg out to Lingostown. They didn't mention it was a 30-minute walk from the end of the trolley to the farm. <laughs> the first caretakers for the farm, there were two sets of caretakers that I know of, there may, may have been others, was Mr. and Mrs. Forrest, and that is the correct spelling, it was given to me by the lodge, for, foot. They, they started in 1909, and they were the first ones that took care of people on the farm, and took care of the farm. There were others that were hired locally that came in and helped with the farm. Okay, there we go. Now this is what I thought was really interesting, and in fact, in talking to the historian, he was unaware of it. This was March 13, 1911. They dedicated the cemetery on the farm, and the first, well, they called inmate, but the first person was buried in the uh, cemetery at the farm. <coughs> Again, the grand chaplain, I just want to point out his name, John Q. Adams. His name shows up a lot because he was here in Harrisburg. He was one of the board members. He helped at the farm. This was Jeremiah Hollis. He was one of the first ones I found that was actually passed away at the home. And this was actually from 1939. There had been more before him, but we were able to find his death certificate. And it says on there where he was buried, and it's Masonic. Lingostown, Pennsylvania. So that confirms with us that there definitely was a cemetery there. <clears throat> These three articles span a period of time, but I thought they were very interesting. Three men are in jail and accused of a theft at the farm. They stole produce from the farm. What I thought was interesting here is that they found they had a retired detective from the city of Harrisburg track him down. He had to go to York. But he was able to capture them. They served time for stealing from the farm. And I think in that day and age, that's something that we should understand, that they did work with people. The second one is the most amazing thing. Now remember, it was 1908 they purchased the farm. 1911 they were debt free. They paid off the mortgage. Now that's amazing. The farm, because of selling the produce, because of what of donations from all of the lodges. All the lodges supported the farm when they could. They were able to keep it debt free. The last one is the only other person I found that had passed away in the home, uh, at least that there wasn't uh, an obituary on him, and that was in 1926. <coughs> Here's the interesting part. 
1924, the Elmira Cemetery Association claimed ownership of the farm. It seemed that our friend John Q. Adams, when he passed away, he left everything in his estate to the Elmira Cemetery Association. And because he had signed the deed to the farm, and it was in his name, the farm went to the Cemetery Association. Now, what happened is, if you look at the date, they asked for a hearing at the courts in 1924. They got the hearing from August to October. They got settlement on the hearing, and the farm won. And the Masonic organization was allowed to keep the farm. And in fact, the Elmira, New York uh, Cemetery Association did not even contest it. They just let them have the farm. Uh, the neat thing is, that's my hometown, Elmira, New York. <laughs> the cemetery they're talking about is Woodlawn Cemetery. Some of you may have heard of a gentleman by the name of Samuel Clements, otherwise known as Mark Twain, is buried in that cemetery. And it was about the time that the orphanage was started. <clears throat> Felix Gardner sent me these clippings. These are from 1930. Uh, 34. This is when, up until 1929, the orphanage was doing very well. It was self-sufficient. But then we had the Depression. When the Depression hit, the, the, all of the organizations throughout the state were hurting, and also the orphanage was hurting. So money was very tight. So he had a pilgrimage to the orphanage. And he brought men in from all over the, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, all over Pennsylvania. And they started to work to save the orphanage. They had a board set up, and these five men here were the board that tried to come up with different ways, whatever they could do to save it. The, the kids in the orphanage were sent to a different orphanage uh, around 1935, but the men stayed there. Here's an aerial view, and this sort of gives you an idea of the size of the farm and where it was located. The farm was down in the corner where that red arrow is, and this is an enlargement of it here. But I wanted to point out it was right next door to the great Linglestown Fair. So basically, they were right next to each other. So all through the 1920s, when there was a huge fair going on, the farm was probably very active in that. I have no proof of that, but they were good neighbors. <clears throat> if you look at the enlargement, you'll see there's a barn, the house, and you can see some outbuildings. It's a little grainy, but you get an idea that that was the farm. As far as I can tell, I think, and of course my pointer doesn't work, but I think where those trees are might have been where the orchard was. <coughs> but remember this picture. Because as we go on, we'll see what happens as everything goes back to nature. Now this is 1940. This is St. Thomas UCC Church. And you can see in the distance the farm. Okay, that's the house. It's the only picture we have of what the house looks like. We're hoping someday to get more. I blew it up to the side, and you can get an idea how many windows are in it. Now, in the 40s, the Hodges took over, and they had upwards of 30 kids. Now, when they took over, they did have some elderly men that were still there. But as she said, as time went on, the, the elderly men, uh, did not, they didn't refill the elderly men, but they kept bringing kids in. Charles and Gail Hodge arrived at the home in about 1940. They came down from Perry County. They were farmers. Uh, Charles actually went out and worked in the fields. He's the one that kept the farm going, kept supporting it. We had one picture tonight that we saw where there was a milk can there, so we think he may have had milk cows at this time of the farm's history. The, the interesting thing is they had... I think it was 11 boys, 17 girls at the time of this article. 
the children attended Lower Paxton High School. They attended Vacation Bible School at the Church of God. We have people here in the audience that we hope will talk later that rode the bus with them. We, we actually had them involved in the community. The home, because they were at this point in time, there wasn't a lot of money coming in from the Grand Lodge. So at this point in time, the community was helping the Hodges. We had the Zion Lutheran Church helped, both helping out with food and clothing, but also with church services. The American Legion Post 272 helped them out at Christmas, helped them out with parties, uh, was very involved with them through the 40s. The Lions Club was very helpful. They also had uh, different parties for them throughout the year. The Colonial Park Fire Department. The Kiwanis Club was amazing. They actually donated a whole park to them. You'll see that in a minute. They had monkey bars, they had slides, they had swings. But the local residents were involved with the Hodges. They really, there was definitely communication back and forth. And I happen to have a neighbor here. Now, Carolyn Byer lived on a farm across the street. And I'm going to let her tell you. Grandparents lived across the no, street. No, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's why I let her tell the story. That's okay. Uh, my grandparents lived across from St. Thomas Reformed in the old farmhouse, which I had absolute run of. I, speaking of the playground, I was jealous <laughs> of the playground these kids had. So they left us play there. I lived in the first house behind St. Thomas, and in the one picture, if you flash back there, you can see a little piece of our garage there above the shed. Oh, That's our garage, and uh, the house is behind this lady's head. Um, I remember just growing up and thinking this was fantastic because Uncle Charlie was constantly in the field. He had his donkeys, he had his plow. Uh, he worked that farm beautifully. He took excellent care, he and the boys, I think, because there was always kids with him working the farm and those fields. And, of course, that was right across from our home, so it was very visible. We were always waving high and everything. And um, To me, it was just a great atmosphere to grow up in because there were so few kids in our neighborhood. And here we have all these 30 kids, and it's just a blind field of friends. But Mamie, and I want to call her Mamie, and she wasn't Mamie. Uh, Aunt Gladys and Uncle Charlie, which the kids called them, were just the sweetest, kindest people. And I dearly love them myself. Um, this is my mother in the coat here. She was, old, she was a brownie, she had a little brownie camera. So thanks to her, we have a lot of pictures of our childhood growing up. Um, I know that was her camera that took the pictures. And these are the kids. That's my sister here in the front, and that little one year, one or two year old back there being held as me. Uh, as you see, the, there was snow on the road, and at times the road would literally drift over, and you had to walk out the road to catch the school bus and come up to the top of the hill to catch the school bus. You can see that the bread man decided he wasn't going back the road. <laughs> Martha Hinkle, our neighbor, bought three loaves of bread that day. And um, yeah, we just had a lot of fun. I, I was quite small, but I don't know when the orphanage closed, but I was probably in my early teens till things began to happen that it was no longer there. Um, Joe, go back to, please. We only briefly. Um, go back to what? Oh, there. Uh, there. We didn't speak. We'll see what that. No, we're, I was going to talk about this in a minute. This already. Thank you. Um, are, are there any of the neighbors that grew up in that given area? Put your hand up. I, can, I didn't grow up there, but I wanted. We built our house in '72, so when we built our house, your parents lived in your house, and I got to know them a little bit because uh, the sister-in-law and 
brother and sister-in-law who lived out on the old Jonestown Road. Oh, right. lived across from my parents. Oh, for heaven's sake. It's a small world. That's why I wonder, because there's a, there are a lot of faces that seem very familiar to me. And maybe nobody figured this out. So, anyway. Don't go for <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn met me one day at the uh, East Shore Library. I, I tried for over two years to find pictures, and I kept posting every so many months on the webpage, uh, if anybody has any pictures of the orphanage. Well, uh, one day, Kathy Gifford put the picture up of the church with the orphanage behind it. And I think Carolyn saw that, and she sent me a note saying, I have some pictures. And it took us a few days to figure out where we were going to meet. But it was amazing to talk to somebody that actually was at the orphanage. When, when you can talk to somebody that's met the kids and talked to them, it's an unbelievable story. you got to look at this, these two pictures. The minister would come every Sunday to hold Sunday school there at the orphanage. The slide over in the back rope ladders, swings, and then Uncle Charlie's helping the kids down the slide. Uh, you know, that was amazing back in those days. This is it, you know, right after the war. Now, before I go on to the next slide, we have a special guest tonight. His name is Bob Thomas, and he has a story for us. <laughs> you can come up here, Bob. Are you afraid of getting I, stuff thrown in you? I'll be up there next month. <laughs> no, I had a, uh, a friend of mine who I've known my whole life, and, and his family grew up on a property that was adjacent to this, shared a, 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 a boundary line. And then he told me the story, and John, you might recall this, that during World War II, they were housing some German prisoners yeah. out at the Gap. <laughs> And evidently, these prisoners found their way to the orphanage. You know, hungry, cold, whatever. And and the story I heard was, you know, probably Mr. Hodge told they took them in, <laughs> but they told them we're gonna have to tell the police you're here, which which they did. And then the police came and took these German prisoners back. But somehow they found their way to this orphanage. Do uh, you remember that John Ang like that? This is George. Yeah, I do. George I do. reminded me of it. Here, give her a mic so we can hear. That's Tom no, George's that's a, <coughs> Yeah, I remember that story. And I used to ride the bus, the school bus, with the children there. You're live. <laughs> I used to ride the school bus with the, those children, and Aunt Gail used to come out and put the children on the bus. and. Uh, then I did hear about that of the uh, prisoners and that, but uh, I enjoyed that. Yes, it's true that. Yeah. I'm surprised Uncle Charlie didn't get him to work on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody else know about it? I wrote on the bus with me with one guy I remember, Jerome Brown. The only one I can remember is Jerome Brown. There was two girls and two boys rode our bus. And I can remember one of the other, not Jerome, but his friend chased his brother uh -oh. by Laura Paxson High School. He never could catch him. <laughs> <laughs> This next article that I threw up here um, comes from May 25th, 1948. Now, one of the things about this, it was the first shrine circus was held at the Farm Show building that was in Harrisburg. And they invited 5,000 different groups to come. And in 1948, up where the Red Arrow is, it says that the Lincolnstown Orphanage and Home uh, was at that showing. So they were involved even down into the city. This picture here is what is left of the, of the orphanage itself. Uh, it looks like a cement trough. It's right out near the highway. Those people that drive on Lincolnstown Road have passed it a million times and never seen it. 
Uh, the picture my wife wouldn't let me put up was the dead deer that was next to her. So you didn't see that. The deer on that field is unbelievable. I, I don't know if you can hunt it or not because there's so much property around it, but they have found a safe haven. All right, now we're getting interesting. 1956. We think the farm, clo the farm closed down someplace between 1952 and 1955. We don't have a definite date. I read someplace it was 55, but uh, when I was at the meeting the other day, Mr. Chris, uh, the supervisor, told me it was, he thought it was 52. But I'm going to be talking to somebody very soon that has all the school records that's going to help me get to the bottom of it. Right, Bob? Right. If you notice the farm in 1956, it's still a farm. You can see where somebody was plowing it. <coughs> Just 14 years later, look how the trees filled it in. It's come straight across. Now by this time, of course, that's today. It's gone back to nature. I hear it's a great place for bird watching, for hiking, for things like that. But don't do it. It's private property, unless you have permission. Uh, it is... Beautiful land, but that little path that's right through the middle, down by the corner, that's electrical lines. That's the cross, the, there is uh, uh, the Penn Electric or PPL goes across there. What we want to do and what we're going to work on for the next few months is getting a state plaque out near the property to let people know what the Masons did. To let them know how hard they worked to keep this orphanage and to keep uh, the, the home going even through the depression. Uh, hopefully, before we get done with this, we'll get to meet some of the relatives of the kids, if not some of the kids that were at the orphanage. Uh, we're trying to get the word out. We want to talk to them. Today, I actually got to talk to a relative of the Hodges. Uh, he, he was aware of them. Uh, he had talked to him. In fact, I was supposed to tell Coach that, see, he is related to the Hodges. He was telling me on the phone today that a lot of people didn't think he was related. <laughs> but he is. We are. We are. This morning, there's a so few of us here. He's here? There's a few of us here. Great. I want to see all of you afterwards. Uh, <laughs> The interesting thing is I believe that this is long overdue. And I think that we should be able to honor the location. The orphanage is gone, but the land is still there. And I really want to double thank okay, the, the, the Grand Lodge for keeping it. Because they've kept it like this. All of Lower Paxton has houses but this. And we still have nature in Lower Paxton. Every time you go by, you can remember what it was like in Lower Paxton. Did it, did it burn down or fall down or deteriorate or what? I had heard different stories, okay. I, uh, somebody here may know better than I if it burned down. We were in the service. Yeah. 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 yeah, I I my understanding was torn down. Somebody said it burnt down, somebody said the barn burnt down, but everything was removed, so it it was old. Okay, it was built in 1908, so, and it, it had been deteriorating. There's a lot of people to thank, okay? A lot of people helped me get this information. And I wanted to thank them very much. But I also want to honor the, the Grand Lodge in Philadelphia, because the historian there and some of the people there were able to get me information uh, that I couldn't find anywhere else. And there's the Grand Lodge of Philadelphia. Wow. Now, what I'd like to do is, anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to say, because I, I know there's a lot of people in the audience that know a lot more about the Masons than I do. And uh, if, if there's any information you have about the orphanage or school that I didn't bring up, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. We'll bring you a mic. Yes, Bill. Can you go back to that picture again I sent you to earlier? There's a word there I'd like to find out something about. 
the two-part picture. One more. There. What is Frisco? Oh, Al Fresco. Oh, Al Fresco. Oh, Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No, I, I thought it was just Fresco. Oh, Al Fresco. Yes. Well, I remember two of the residents being in my class through grade school. We had James, James White and Al Fresco. The two students with that were in school with me were James White and Eleanor Black. And they went all through grade school. I don't know what happened to them. I went through a lot of yearbooks looking to see if I could find any of the students. And I wasn't able to know for sure if they were from the orphanage or not. But hopefully we'll get more information. We're not going to stop searching this. We want to get as much information about it as we can. Anybody else with any questions? Yes? Uh, during the time that we lived on Parkway East, and some of you can help me remember this, do you remember when there was a proposed sale? What? And a proposed sale of that property, and the rumor was, and I didn't go to any of the township meetings, but I'm pretty sure it went that far and was turned down by the township, there was going to be a trailer park put on that property. Yeah. Do, do others of you remember yeah. that there was a time? Yeah, okay. Eisters, we lived on just the other side of the church. And I remember that, I think that was in the 70s, and at the time it uh, was blocked because Central Dolphin could not handle the influx of students mm. that it would have okay. made into the area's schools. Okay. So they turned it down. Okay. Could you hear her? I always wondered <laughs> what the real story was on that. There's a group of men trying to buy it, put a, a farm for golf course in there, but they could never. Is Phil Hemsworth here? Yeah, I'm hiding behind you. Back this way. He's going to buy the ground. What's he talking about? He said he was going to buy the ground. There were three or four other businessmen at the same time as myself. Two of the Moomer brothers and the other one was uh, Major Smith. And we tried to buy that and put a small uh, pitch and putt golf course in there. But we could not find the owners. We had no idea who they were. Yeah, and I'm not going to give you their phone number either. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. What would it take to get the markers placed in those kinds of things? Or they're not in now, presently. So the area is not marked. There's no. There's no historical markers on the property at this time. Uh, what we have to do is apply to the state. Uh, it's, a, it's a long process, but we have to December 1st. Uh, we have an application, which I first have to go to the Grand Lodge because they own the property, get their permission. I'm hoping to get some help from the local lodge members, and we'll fill out the application. We have a gentleman that used to run the historical monuments for the state at one time. He's going to work with us. I talked to him last week and, and help fill out the paperwork. Uh, we all feel we have a very good chance of getting the marker there once the lodge approves it. Uh, but it's going to take about a year. Uh, and it's going to cost us some money, which we will be talking to all of you about. <laughs> what about uh, our state representative, and the one on 105th, Andrew Lewis? Have you uh, talked with him? Is he, uh, we we haven't talked. I did, uh, an hour ago. Oh. <laughs> A lot, of, yeah. a lot of people were at that meeting that Andrew had tonight and then came here. Okay. Uh, the, this, um, we haven't talked to Andrew yet directly about it. Did you say you did? Yeah. yeah. And, um, He's on board. Not on board. Yeah. He, he will definitely be on board. I, I have no doubts. In fact, I think there will be uh, a lot of people, once they know about this, that will be on board. Okay. Uh, once they realize how important this was to the community, they'll be on board. We're going to make sure. I'm going to meet with them on Monday. Good, you hit it, you tell them. <laughs> but I, I think that we, we have a good cause here. Anybody else? Just a, a yeah. question. 
when they bought it, was the was the house already there, or did they build it? Okay, I don't think the house was there. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. The address isn't Lingostown Road. The address is actually St. George Drive. When you look up the address, this is why people have a hard time finding it. I shouldn't say this. Uh, but the, the address actually on the, all the uh, tax papers is back on uh, the other street. I have no idea why, uh, and someday we'll find out. But uh, it's, and, and the, the organization does not want to sell it. They, they want to preserve it. And I, I'm very grateful. Yeah, the barn you can see in the picture was right there on 39. And the house was there too. Yeah, the house was right around the corner. But uh, it, the address was back on St. George for some reason. Did the Hodges move up to Millersburg? I have two different places they moved to. Millersburg was one. They came from Prairie County, and then after they left the farm, they went up in that area, Millersburg, or one of the towns up there. And there's still, I think, Hodges up there, right? And in Carlisle. In Carlisle. Oh, Carlisle. Carlisle. Oh, Carlisle. Oh, yeah, in Carlisle. Yeah, in fact, they have a basketball tournament going on right now in Carlisle. Hey, hey, Thank Joe. you for coming here instead of going there. Hey, Joe. <laughs> yes. Joe, over here. Yes. I can tell you exactly where it was because my grandparents lived in Fisherville just a little bit northeast of Halifax. The, and there was a farm there, and I just read, you know, I guess it's exhibiting how old I am. And I can remember visiting my grandparents in Fisherville. And the farm there was the Hodges, and it, it, they told us it was an orphanage. In fact, I looked up the property on the Dauphin County land map, and it shows Charles Hodge owned the property I'm thinking of. So I, it, it's, it's, I can tell you exactly where it is. It, as you leave Halifax and head towards Elizabethville, uh, one of the first roads you hit on the right is called Rudder Lane. It, it's right near the Harmon Stove Factory, if you know where that is up there. The farm's still there. But, but when you started, when Joe started telling me about this, and I started trying to connect dots in my head because I knew there was an orphanage up there, and their name was Hodges. And then it... It's, I, I think the dots connect. I think that's where, if it's the same Charles Hodge, I think that's where they were. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? Yes? Um, I, I just want to say I'm really glad that you're doing this. I grew up on Sandy Hollow Road, and I never um, graduated from Central Dauphin in the early 70s, and I never knew anything about this and driving past it all those years. And even I remember the Lingelstown Bicentennial, and I don't remember anything about this being talked about then. I'd also like to mention that I'm grateful to the Lodge for maintaining this property all these years. Um, my husband and I participated in the uh, Breeding Bird Atlas that the, um, that Audubon does every 20 years or so. So the most recent one was in the early 2000s, and that property was in our survey area. We didn't walk it, but we did bird around the edges of it, and there are really some um, significant warblers, and also because there's a small wetlands there, a number of wetlands birds, and I would really hope that the lodge would continue to keep it as green space because it is very valuable to more than just deer. Thank you. Okay, yes, sir. Ma'am. Well, I'm questioning why the Masons purchased the land there and where did these children come from? The, the lodge is in Philadelphia. Why? Well, the lodge. Actually, the, the Grand Lodge is in Philadelphia, but the, all the lodges in Pennsylvania, okay, at the time, they were in Altoona, Erie, Pittsburgh, uh, Harrisburg, 
uh, all the, and there's multiple lodges that belong to the Grand Lodge, uh, they sent kids from all over. Some of these men that we found their death notices on, uh, one went to Baltimore uh, when they buried him, because even though he was from Pittsburgh, his family was in Baltimore. Uh, and they would come from all over to live there. Um, the, the reason I think that they, the, the lodge was originally got it was because they were able to purchase the castle farm. Okay, and this was back in, I think they purchased it in 1908. But uh, they brought in kids, uh, the original, my understanding is the, the original orphanage and home, and correct me if anybody knows any different, uh, they brought kids from all over, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Erie. Yep. The article that has the, that goes with the picture. From the 1940 era. Right. It was local. It was local. Yeah. 1940s, it was local. But the original was uh, from all over the state, especially the men. I don't, do you, yes? The lodge in Harrisburg. That's my lodge, chosen tread number 43. I've heard from some of the older brothers. I've been in the lodge since 1968. And that chosen tread, our lodge, had a lot to do with it. And then the Grand Lodge took over, and they own it now. That's what I was asking you to, today. Whose name is on the ownership, on the deed for the lodge? Oh, yeah, on the deed is the lodge. Okay. okay. The lodge now in Philly is on the deed. Okay, that's the Grand Lodge. Right. But before that, when I traced it back, okay, uh, it was, uh, well, the very first person that was on it was our friend John Q. Adams. Okay, now when that problem happened, that deed was then transferred to the lodge. Now, right, but what, what I'm asking... There, there wasn't a, another person that was on it that was an organization after John Q. Adams. Yeah, it was, it was under the, the Philadelphia Lodge, the Grand Lodge. Okay, but, but they were the stories, with, uh, because I used to hear them talking about the land in Lingolstown, and uh, we were supposed to build a hotel there. Have you heard that story? I didn't hear that one. Let's hear it. <laughs> we were supposed to build a hotel there, and there was some uh, political stuff, and I understand the politics of things, <laughs> and uh, it never happened. And when was that? What year would that would have been? That was a bit around in the seventies. In the seventies, because I was in the lodge. In 1968, I'm 77 years old, and I remember the older brothers, 80 and 90, and 75 at that time, talking about those things. And I even brought it up in our lodge meeting one night that we had land in Lingolstown, and then the Grand Lodge in Philadelphia on Broad Street, they took over and they are the sole owners of it. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I think I think what you're what, what you're very right about is Harrisburg was always looked at as the caretaker. Right. And, and I think you still are the caretaker because the, the gentleman that I was communicating with in Harrisburg uh, still is the one that authorizes people to use the land. You, you talk about Billy Mills. Billy Mills, yeah. From still. So. Yep. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. What my cousin is not alluding to is he's also a descendant of a Hodge also. <laughs> Sorry, am I? I think so is he. That's the way we're here right now. We want to get a picture of all the Hodges. And, and uh, the, the gentleman he talked to earlier, Jacob Hodge, couldn't make it. His brother had passed away in a basketball court. I don't know if y'all know. Back in 1980, his name was Jay Hodge. He was Jay one of the, he was one of the leading scorers in Pennsylvania at the time, yeah, wow. and and he was a great basketball player. And he fell on the basketball court playing playing against Steel High. Oh. So he has a memorial basketball tournament every year at this time, mm -hmm. and he has like the preliminaries going on right now, and all the finals start on Saturday. So. 
I'm a member of his lodge. I used to be a member of Chosen Friends, but I did it back to my, I'm from Carlisle, Pennsylvania also. Moved to Harrisburg, just like my cousin Wesley is. He used to be my principal too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we are also cousins of the Hodges. I think so is he. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have, you, have, you have one lodge here. I don't know how many lodges are represented here today. I see one from chosen friends. I see. Hey, can we get all the Hodges to stand up, please? <laughs> you have know, my last name from That's close enough. You're but, doctor. Yeah, we have, our, our names change. Thank you. I love talking to you. Uh, I, I guess we should give it Mike Young because he's representing the Grand Lodge. He does all the talking. You don't make that. You know, I first learned of this. There is a committee that uh, the Grand Lodge has that uh, represents the uh, the property, the, uh, Mills and Company. Uh, but I happened to be at uh, the hardware store over on Linglestown Road uh, about a week ago when I was looking at. I was paying my bill and I was looking at. Uh, uh, the counter, and there was a Paxson Harrell. <laughs> <there. laughs> and I said, wow. Wow, this is, this is great. But a week ago. So I said, hey, I'm going to go to that. And so I notified the Grand Lodge about it. They already knew about it through other channels, through the official channels. But I sent them an email. And in preparing for this, I said, well, what can I uh, tell them about, about Prince Hall and about... Uh, the Masons. Well, they know a hundred times, a million times more than I. My goodness, this is amazing. This is so great. Uh, I wanted to say our current Grandmaster is Melvin A. Hall, uh, Austin, and uh, I want to convey to you his deepest appreciation for this. He really appreciates this. Years ago, uh, a couple of Grandmasters ago, maybe 20 years, uh, we had a big cleanup out there at the property. Uh, we had a good time with uh, refreshments and all that sort of thing. We just picked up papers and different things. And uh, that's when I got first introduced to the, to the property. Uh, now they have a committee, and you, and you Joe, you, uh, you're in touch with the committee. So. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, John. But because I grew up near there, after we had our own property in the 70s, we took a couple foundation stones from the house. <laughs> 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 By 1940, they started in 1908. Foot had, had a farm behind Linglestown. Yes. He used to bring milk over to Linglestown every day. That may be a relative. That most likely was. They had a, they had a son called. Yeah. Uh, Margaret was a, was the girl's name. She went to Lower Paxton. And what was the name? Jerome? No, that's wrong. Frank. 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 Yeah. Frank. 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 I got killed in Harrisburg one time. You remember that one? I know we came to our farm one night drunk. Oh, she was. Dad and Mom was not like that. Yeah, the police were not a problem. He took our gas pump there for our tractors and pulled it right out of the ground. He was one strong guy. I think he got killed in Harrisburg. 
Okay. I, any other final questions, and then we'll move on. Yes, Bill. What is the picture? The picture is the, is the gentleman he was talking about is Melvin A. Austin, who is the grandmaster of all of Pennsylvania. He's the big guy, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Now the building, I don't know. What's the build, building? Let me correct something here about yeah. the Grand Lodge of all of Pennsylvania. Here, go. Let's give a little history of the Masons. Good. Uh, well, a long time ago, the, the white Grand Lodge didn't recognize the black Masons. A long time ago. Uh, well, I guess 30 years ago, the two Grand Masters met. The white grandmaster and the black grandmaster. I hate to put it that way. <laughs> That's the only way you can do it. But uh, they, they, we meet, we integrate, we, we, we join each other's lodges, we do all kinds of things together. Uh, but back then, so what, what our grandmasters call, it's called the uh, most worshipful grandmaster. Okay, the white master is called the right worshipful grandmaster. So we're the most worshipful, he's a right worshipful. <laughs> they get together, we visit, we have a good time, uh, we have uh, affairs together, and it's, it's all good. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know where that is. That, that came off the website. I wanted his picture, and the only way I could get it was to take it with the building, and it's in Pittsburgh someplace. Not Philadelphia, not Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Yes, sir. Uh, as a parent that lives right here in this, this area, I, I'm not originally from Central Pennsylvania. So I moved here. We needed to find a place to stay and landed not too far right by the library. And I would say you made the right choice. Yes. <laughs> you, made, you made the right choice. You don't always hear all the positive things, but in this room, hearing the stories and really not that long ago, but it feels that long ago. Yeah. If we could take this and kind of pick it up and say, the rest of, the, of America, take a look. <laughs> 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 and we hope now that you've come and seen us once a month. My wife won't let me join nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> There's no point. We just come and listen. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll end it this way before my daughter yells at me. Uh, you'll notice we court some of our kids. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Son's here. Uh, yes. We can back his daughter. My daughter's here. Because these are things that are really our history, not your advice, our history. But you won't hear it in school. No. This is local history that just impacts everybody else. Mm -hmm. If you think about the age range in this room, you're going 80 years. Yes, yes. And you get to talk and share, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That is why this commission was formed, is to get this information out to the people that need to hear it. And that's the whole purpose. Each of our presentations have been about things people did not know. And the orphanage is one thing I would say that if you talk to the average person in this township, they had no idea. Anyone else before I close it down? Yes, sir. They don't have any like old photographs. They don't have any old photographs of the uh, home, the orphanage, and their possessions. Well, there was a, a problem with some of their records. Okay, uh, they they had an issue, and I don't know if it was a fire or flood or what. But they they have a lot of pictures, but they lost a lot of records, and because of the time that this happened in the 20s and 30s, now. Felix has really been trying hard to find us things, and he's still looking because we're going to put together a whole package. Uh, and, and I'm hoping, believe it or not, someday to be able to do a, a small book on it because it really is very interesting, but I need a lot more information. You've seen almost everything I have, and uh, it isn't much. But it was, the, the, the other thing to remember is all these articles out of the paper came from across the state. This wasn't just the Harrisburg paper. So it was well known throughout the state back in its day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.